Well, good morning again. Good morning. Thank you. It's great to hear so many voices, young and old. Hey, uh, today we continue a series, uh, Lessons from the Early Church. Uh, Nikki preached last week, and I think she did a great job. Uh, today I want to talk about leadership and how we see leadership in the early church. And in the very first book of Acts, um, the disciples are facing a leadership challenge. And let's uh, see what we can learn from that. So would you rise as I read from Acts 1, 20 through 26. For, said Peter, is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the, G- the Lord Jesus was living among us beating from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So he nominated two men, Joseph called Barabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, do you know everyone's heart? Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. The word of our Lord. Please be seated. You know, a very simple question. We live in a time and a place that seems fairly bereft of great leadership. Have you noticed? You know, when I ask you, great leaders, you might think of some business people or others, but we don't, we don't have the Gandhis or the George Washingtons or the Lincolns or even, you know, the Winston Churchills or other, you know, just incredible charismatic leaders that unify. And for me, I think of, you know, just, not just those political leaders in many ways, but I think of leaders who moved because of the Spirit. Heroes, as I put, think of it, heroes of the church. Augustine of Hippo, you know, St. Augustine, it's, it's, as some call him. Mother Teresa, and of course, Jesus Christ, you know. We're all incredible leaders, and so were the twelve. And it's challenging a time and a place where we don't have incredible role models to think, you know, we, we think of these great leaders, and we think, I'm not one of those, right? But believe it or not, we're all called to leadership. We're all called to fill the vacuum, and God calls on us in different ways. Paul talks about the body of Christ and how we're all called to different parts of it. You know, feet, the hands, the ears, the mouth, the eyes. And we're all called to do this work in this world, And you might say, well, what does that have to do with leadership? For us as Christians, leadership has to look different. When a lot of people today think about leadership, they think about fame and power. But Christians have to think of leadership in a different way. As I talked about a few weeks ago, if you were here, our leadership is based on a principle that is so very different different. It's not based on position. It's not based on titles. It's not based on even what money we have or skills that we possess. But rather, our leadership is based primarily on how we can serve. When Jesus on the night that he was to be taken, got down on his knees and washed the feet of the disciples, he exemplified the type of leadership he calls on all of us to do. In stepping down and showing his disciples that to be a leader was to serve, he changed the dynamic. 
when James and John came to him and said, can we sit next to you in heaven? And he goes, well, if you're first here on earth, you're going to be last in heaven. What Jesus kept telling his disciples over and over and over again was that our definition of leadership is wrong. Our perceptions about leadership are incorrect. That we gather to do God's work and the people who are leading are the ones serving the most, giving the most. And you might say, well, what do I have to give? And my response to you is, we all are also. When we enter into that moment when we become Christ, when we join the church, when we say, you are our Lord, God, our Savior, he promises to give us spiritual gifts for the service of the church. Every one of us. Every one of us. Romans 12, 6 through 8 says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouragement, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, then do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Now Paul does call out service, but what Paul also talks about is all of these gifts, leadership, talents, that, we, that he talks in many places about are given to all those who follow Christ, and we are to use them for the service of his people, not to our glorification, but to the glorification of God. And the Bible suggests so many gifts, and I want to tell you, those gifts are not prescriptive in the Bible. They're suggestive rather than exhaustive. There's so many gifts that were given and the problem is, so many Christians don't look for their gifts. Christ gives us a gift, but it's like getting something at Christmas, and we don't want to open it because then what if it's not the right gift, right? God gives us a gift, and he says, here's this magnificent gift in a beautiful box. And you go, it's a beautiful box. I don't want to open it because I might be disappointed. That's what a lot of Christians do. I don't want to examine what God's given to me because, well, then I have to use it, right? Then it might not be the gift I want. And so the most basic thing is when people say, I don't have a gift from God, I ask, have you ever asked him what he's given to you? Have you ever examined your life and look at what you're good at, what you incline yourself toward, what inclinations, what motivations God has given to you and how you use it? I look around here, and there are so many gifts, and I wonder why people don't use them. So we have to open the box to know what gifts we have to use. The other thing is, we've got to use our gifts to develop them. No one, no one becomes good at something until they work at it. I'm still working at preaching. I've got a lot of work to do because I want to get better and better and better. But it's a tool that God has given to me. It's like anything else in, in life. If we want to get better at it, there are very few and rare exceptions where you become a concert pianist without a lot of practice. Where any of the praise team who give and share their gift of music with us probably didn't get there overnight. We have to use those spiritual gifts to get better at using those spiritual gifts. To even find out if they're a gift at all. Some of us might think, I'm a great teacher, only to discover, maybe not. Here, the other thing I want to I point out too is, the ways we get this wrong though, is some of us can think we have a gift, a calling, and it's not confirmed. If you look at the passage today, the disciples looked, and they thought it was either Matthias or Justice, right? And they figured out it's Matthias, not Justice. I wonder what ever happened to Justice. He's never mentioned again, right? And Matthias only gets that single line. But that's the other part of this whole thing. One way we, get it, we can get it wrong, too, is we think we have a gift. 
but it's not affirmed by the congregation, the community. And that's why community is so important. That's why it's so different. I hear again and again and again, people say, well, I can be a Christian on my own. I work on my own spirituality. And I go, yeah, but where's your community to tell you you're doing the things right or wrong? Where's the people that give you the feedback and help you develop your gifts and then also give you the hard truth that, well, maybe that's not a gift? Or you're abusing that gift. Where are the people to check you and help you and nurture you? And that's the third part of it. Where are you giving your gift to for the service of the king? That final part for us is we are called into community so we can use that gift for the betterment, not just of the community, but the world. But we have a power when we work in community. But we also have the correction and the discipline and the nurture, like we talked about this morning, the twins, that only is found in community. In a community that loves us enough to tell us when we're wrong and when we're right, and calls us to use our gifts in places that we find dangerous, like on this chancel. We're, you know, one of my favorite things is to take people who might have a calling to ministry or to preaching and teaching and give them the opportunity to preach and teach because this is a scary little space, I gotta tell you, to stand in front of all of you and share what I think God is giving to me this week. And I, one of my joys, and I think it's one of my gifts, is to help develop these folks, and I hope I help Dan, who is our newest, you know, intern, develop in that. And that is an integral part of this community of faith. So my question to you today is, what gifts don't you share with us? Or what gifts do you share with us, but you need to develop more? Ask God. Examine your life and ask the people around you who you trust because I know they won't steer you wrong. Let's go to God right now in prayer and ask him to help us understand what gifts he's calling us to use today. Oh Lord, we thank you for the gift, your spiritual gifts, and your call on us into leadership, a leadership that is so different from the world's, a leadership that's based on servanthood, of sacrifice and of giving rather than of taking. Oh, Lord, help us build each other up, not for our own glory or the glory of the, in this church, but for your glory and the body of our risen Lord. We thank you, Lord, and we ask for your help in all that we do. In your son's name we pray this morning. Amen.